Um, so uh, we're here tonight, uh, Audubon, so the local Pittsburgh Sound Audubon Society is sponsoring tonight's Tuesday Night Science Talk. And I wanted to let you know I've got a couple of um, Audubon magazines on the table and a couple of calendars. Please take one if you like. And also there's a bunch of CD-ROMs, um, Alaska Bird Songs. If anybody still uses CD technology, please help yourself. Those you can always transfer it digitally. Um, is anybody in here a member of Audubon? Awesome. So if you become a member of Audubon or you subscribe to the Audubon magazine, you automatically become a member of the local chapter. Um, so we're encouraging everybody to uh, renew your memberships. If you haven't become an Audubon member, please do. Take a look at the magazine up front. It's beautiful content. Um, sometimes you even get photographers like um, Milo show up in Audubon every once in a while, <clears throat> which is a great seg into tonight's talk, which the very last talk we had planned three years ago uh, was Milo's trip to Western Australia. COVID shut us down and we weren't able to have that talk. So here we are hitting a reboot. Milo's had three years to polish the talk. <laughs> he still says it's gonna be a little long, so if you get hungry or whatever, you want to start tapping your watch, shuffling a little bit, you know, whatever. But uh, Milo used to work for us at the Forest Service as a statistics he used to work. I used to work. He used to work, and now he's um, he's retired, but he's far from idle. Uh, he's been just traipsing all over the place. Last I heard, you were in Nome, and then he went somewhere tropical. I saw a picture of. Um, Paula drenched in rain, and, uh, and now I hear you're going off to Antarctica, so he's putting his skills to work in his second life after the Forest Service, and tonight he's going to give us the three-year delayed Western Australia field trip. Thank you, Milo. Thanks. <laughs> it's not my trip, it's mine and Paula's oh, trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my presentation, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, And is there a pointer on here? Uh, does anybody know this? There should be a pointer, yeah. Do you know what this is? Oh, I thought that was latched. Side button turns okay. like the lock button. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Want to push it down? Got it. Okay. All right. You guys, I think, all know me. Milo Burchup. Uh, that's my wife Paula sitting in the back. We were going to give this presentation just last three years ago, um, but gosh, when the world shut down, we did this trip. Luckily, right before the world shut down, we uh, started this trip in like mid. October and it went through November basically six weeks on the road in Western Australia We flew to Perth and started our trip from there. I'll show you a map and some kind of give you some background on, on what we did um, It was a big under undertaking Australia is huge, but Western Australia is a, a big part of Australia and uh, Anyway, we tried to fit a lot in so you can't do it all but we sure as hell tried <laughs> Um, for some background, we've kind of become infatuated with Australia. We made that was this has been th this was our third trip. Um, in 2014, we went with the Smythe family and a few other tagalongs like Sarah Hefner and uh, covered the East Coast. And we covered the East Coast. And this was a six-week trip, something like 6,000 miles. Uh, Paula and I did a little side to Darwin and then met up with the group again, and we went all the way down to Tasmania. We flew into Sydney, drove north, drove south and then ended up in Tasmania. So that was 2014. We loved every bit of it. It was just fascinating. Uh, so much so that Paula and I wanted to see more. So in 2016, we went back and flew to Melbourne, 
and did this trip right up through the center, which included uh, Uluru or Ayers Rock in the center, and the Red Center, and then went up to Darwin again, uh, to the Kakadu National Park. And it just whet our appetite for seeing more, and so this trip we planned it to tackle the West Coast uh, and flew to Perth, which you can see down there in the bottom left. We drove through the interior, uh, so our route was like, oh, um, so we flew to Perth, we drove this interior route, uh, and, and then these dots are kind of our destinations. We covered a lot of ground in between our target places, and you could spend uh, a year exploring uh, this in more detail. But uh, anyway, we picked out some places we want to see. The Charles Darwin Reserve, Kirajini National Park. I got up here to the coast and went to the Broome area and the Kimberley, just touched the Kimberley in a place called Winchan Gorge right here. Uh, worked our way back down and went to this area. And this is fascinating, the Nangaloo Reef. It's smaller than the uh, uh, Barrier Reef, but you can drive to it and walk into the water with your snorkel gear and you, you, know, you don't need boat rides to get out to the reef. Uh, it's very accessible. Uh, that's here at the next bounce mount. Peninsula and uh, Coral Bay are the two access areas. It's Cape Range National Park right here. Uh, then we went further south to another peninsula uh, where, uh, uh, where Shark Bay is and this uh, kind of a tourist trap but a deep place called Monkey Maya uh, we went to. And then we drove further south and kind of went through Perth, but we checked out Rotten Nest Island and Penguin Island. And then our final couple weeks, we explored the Southwest. And that include, included uh, uh, Busselton area right here, Swan River, uh, Denmark, Albany, and then Dryandra Forest uh, before we had to fly home. So that's a summary of, of where we went. And I'm gonna divide this into chunks. We're gonna kind of revisit each, uh, we're gonna do a few laps around. We're gonna talk about the trip, the places that we went to. I don't do very many scenics, so I'm just gonna kind of show you this is where we went. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, the mammals, the birds, and then the best part for last, the reptiles. Uh, reptiles and amphibians that we saw, and then uh, talk about the people we met. I'll end up, I'll end with that. And I'll try to get through this. Like I say, this is longer than I would like it to be. I hate the excuse to be that I, you know, I wanted to pack it all in, but I kind of want to pack it all in. So uh, let's get going. This is uh, my Onyx app, uh, a waypoint of all of our campsites and how long we stayed in each. Because we were gonna drive a lot, I wanted to try to spend like two nights in a place. Uh, so you, and so how, how long we stayed in a place is right here, uh, the 2X, 2X, 3X. Uh, I think the longest we stayed in a place was uh, uh, Cape Range National Park, five, five nights, Coral Bay two. Um, and there's a few, you know, one night stands, Port Headland and Myrie Pool. Um, yeah, the Oscar range, uh, the limestone quarry was one. But anyway, we tried to kind of settle into places for at least two nights so we weren't driving every single day, but still we did a lot of driving. We started in Perth, a beautiful city uh, in on the coast of southern part of uh, Western Australia. Uh, anyway, a beautiful place. Um, we camped the whole way, and this is what we've done on all three of our trips with the Smites and then our other trip. Uh, very, very few hotel nights. Uh, at Room Bird Observatory, which was three total nights, uh, we stayed in a room at the, the Bird Observatory. Other than that, I don't know that we stayed. Uh, the family that uh, um, kind of hosted us when we arrived uh, put us up for a couple of nights at the beginning and at the end. Uh, and other than that, we basically uh, uh, stayed in a tent every night. We rented a car. And that proved the toughest part of all three of our trips, getting a good car for a decent price. Uh, you know, a, a full on four wheel drive is expensive. We got an SUV, I reserved an SUV, but in Australia, SUV doesn't necessarily mean four wheel drive. That was a surprise to me. And after we got it, we found out we were restricted to this little triangle uh, from Perth up to Exmouth basically. And we kind of ignored that and drove much way outside of where we were supposed to go with the car, and I also wrecked it. Um, 
this is hilarious. The, the, mo the, the lo logo for the company that rents the cars is no birds. So we were driving around Bernie for six weeks and the car said no birds. <laughs> so this again is the trip. Uh, that little triangle where we were supposed to keep the car uh, was basically you know, like right here. Uh, so yeah, you can see we broke that. And somebody ratted on us uh, because we didn't have a four-wheel drive. When we went into the Kimberly, we wanted a four-wheel drive. So in uh, Broome, we rented a, a, a nice Jeep for just a few days. And uh, we think it's them that called the No Birds company and said, hey, you guys, you got a car way out of, way out of bounds here. Uh, when we returned the car and fessed up to our accident, uh, uh, they noted that we'd been they knew we were out of our I think area. they have GPS tracking. <laughs> they might have. I don't know if they do. I don't know if they do. Dead, but yeah. So let's start on the road trip, and I'll show you the places that we went. I'm going to do this quite quickly because I don't take a lot of landscape pictures. The Charles Darwin Reserve, this is much pinker on my laptop than it is on the screen, but we'll just live with that. Um, beautiful field of flowers. Um, we were at the tail end of our, uh, of, of the, uh, of spring, I was trying to race spring and, and you know kind of get this trip in before summer, but we definitely lost that race. Um, but in Charles Darwin Reserve, when we got out of the wheat belt and into some of, some of the wilder country, we did see wildflowers like like this, which were beautiful. Um, but it got hot and it got hot fast. Uh, this is when did you start? Hmm? When did you start? Mid mid October. Uh, this is a mining town that we drove through, just kind of, you know, classic uh, outback Australia. Um, there's Paula pointing to a sign with her name on it. Uh, the, the town called Payne's Fine is only 165 kilometers away. Uh, this is just a roadside stop, a, a, a truck stop that we went into. They had a caged uh, uh, parrot, and uh, this is pretty funny. Truckers going by behind me uh, were telling me he blights. <laughs> and not to trust his bird, but it was pretty cute. There were so many stops and interactions like that that are half the fun of travel. Um, and we've all been away from that for so many years. Um, but anyway, um, so we drove north on this highway uh, right here. And one of our first de destinations was Karajini National Park. And this is in the Pilbara, Pilbara uh, desert area. It's kind of a very red desert uh, country, which is a lot of Australia, but they call it the Pilbara region. And uh, we heard, I had heard a lot of neat things about Kirigini National Park, and it was beautiful. Uh, all these uh, gorges with water in the bottom of them, swimming holes galore, and that's what it's kind of uh, known for. And, and there, this particular gorge, Hammersley Gorge, is one of the popular hiking trails. It goes about a mile in the bottom of the gorge there. And uh, this was the first swimming hole. It was pretty popular. You can see uh, uh, some people right here. I think right by the waterfall is where we met the Turtle Girls, and I'll refer to them again, uh, you know, some of the people that we met along the way. Um, but yeah, it's hot, but these wonderful swimming holes are what make it uh, more bearable. Uh, and then the walking was unlike anything we've seen with all this angular red rock. Uh, yeah, it was a trail, but a lot of it was just walking on uh, red rock shelves like this. Here's Paula uh, cruising along. And then, you know, every few hundred, you know, a half a kilometer or something like that would be a pool, that, you know, that was good for swimming. This is uh, Round's Pond, I think, or uh, uh, was at the end of the trail, the, the last one that we swam in. And here at the beginning was this fern pool, uh, waterfall that we swam under. Um, the next day there was another one, you know, and you hiked through a gorge and had to wade through sections of it like this. Um, this is a, a couple that uh, we met along the way. Um, so anyway, 
we spent a couple of nights in Karagini National Park. Like I said, we moved on. Uh, we hit the coast at this place called Cape Corral's Rift. I, I guess you had your birthday there. Yeah, my birthday. Uh, it was a beautiful place. It was our first time seeing, uh, at least on this trip, uh, the, I'm blanking on the name of the ocean right now. Help me, help me, Liz. Uh, Coral Sea. Coral Sea. Coral sea. In, in, uh, Coral sea, I think. Um, but anyway, it was beautiful, tropical. Uh, and then as dusk came around, we started realizing, ouch, ouch, you know, we're getting bit by bugs, we're getting bit by bugs bad. Uh, and so we had to put on all kinds of bug, bug dope and stuff. Um, and then a little breeze came up. We thought, oh, good, great, that's just what we need to keep the bugs down. But then we got slapped by a storm, like, unbelievable. It, it bent our tent, we had to take it down, we jumped in the car. Uh, it passed after a couple hours, but uh, anyway, her birthday was interesting. <laughs> Um, then we continued up the coast. Uh, so Cape Corraldrin, I think, is right here. We drove what's called 80 Mile Beach. We just saw a little piece of that with the uh, town of Broome. And uh, Gan Gan Grantium Point is right here. And then this is the start of the Kimberley region, which is a pretty well-known or famous outback area. And I wanted to see more of that, but it was hot. And when I say hot, like almost every day of our trip from where we probably Char Charles Darwin Reserve on north until we got back to Perth was over 100 degrees every day. Uh, it, it was really hot. Um, here's Broome. It's uh, famous for its shorebirds, uh, and there's a, a bird observatory there, um, beautiful mudflats, and then uh, mangroves. Uh, this is at Gantium Point, uh, and this was really cool because it's famous for dinosaur tracks, uh, fossil tracks uh, on, on the rock uh, at low tide that you can get down to. We had to look pretty hard for them, and we found this one, and it wasn't until we got home and looked at the pictures of it that we realized there's another track right behind her heel. Uh, we just saw one theropod track, but there's another one right behind her that we didn't realize at the time. So at so what point did you run into salters? Uh, there could be some on the coast here, but typically the places that we spent time, there was only freshwater crocodiles. But there could be some at Broome, but I think they're kind of uncommon uh, there. We didn't see any salties on this trip. This is the, like you could see one here. This is the coastline by the Bird Observatory, uh, but we did not, and it's just what beautiful. What are salties? Saltwater crocodiles. Thank you. Yeah, and we saw freshwater crocodiles, and I'll show you those. Um, now again, <laughs> yeah, the difference here of what I'm seeing on my screen, uh, the, it is just red. The soils are just like off the charts red. And uh, uh, the water is very, very blue. It looks kind of muted here on this display, uh, but it was beautiful, you know, breathtaking. And the road was this dusty road, just brilliant red sand. And you have wallabies, you know, herds of them, like from up to a dozen or 20 of them crossing the road in front of you as you drove along it. Uh, yeah, it was something else. Uh, and from Broome, we went into the Kimberley region, which I just described to you, the, the kind of blank spot on the map up here. And uh, we left Derby and took a dirt track and got to about here in this place called Winchana Gorge and then Tunnel Creek National Park. Um, this is Winchana Gorge right here. This river is dry with just a few pools in it. And this thing was so full of freshwater crocodiles, you couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, when the river dries up, they're all concentrated in these little pools. And then I'm gonna show you guys this, because I still don't know what we saw or, or what the term for it is. This is a terrible little phone video, but watch it. Um, and my question is, what meteoro meteorologically is going on? Because the sky, it was night, the sun had set uh, quite a while before, and a very active thunderstorm was a little bit uh, southwest of us, and the sky, the clouds glowed orange. And this kind of shows that it goes in and out of focus. But you can see the really active lightning that's going on there. But the clouds, and this is underexposed, the orange was a little more extensive than that. Uh, but the clouds continued to glow while all that lightning was happening. And I've looked up something called St. Elmo's Fire. Yeah, yeah it's St. Elmo's Fire. It doesn't quite fit that, but maybe that, that's what it is. How, how far out the sunset was that? Uh, far enough where it wouldn't be the sun. Uh, a couple hours. I don't, all I can say is I don't think so. Yeah. 
Uh, I thought of that. I also thought of a bushfire reflecting onto the clouds, but I really think it's something you know, electrically charged in the clouds. It, it was fascinating. And we had one other couple in the campground, uh, there was only two, two groups uh, in the whole campground of Magenta Gorge, and we got to see that. It, it, we only got a couple drops of rain and a little bit of wind, but the next morning, the river was flowing. You know, I told you it was just that dry pool and dry riverbed. Well, um, see this red line? That's where the water, you know, so this is when it was still low and dry. And then here's what it looked like the next day. It was probably six to eight feet higher and all this junk was in the river. Uh, but anyway, it had rained very hard from where that we had seen that lightning and it must've been a flash flood overnight. It, it was quite striking. That's Manjana Gorge. And very close to Manjana Gorge is a place called Tunnel Creek National Park or Tunnel Cave. And it's a cave about a kilometer long and you walk through it and there's uh, flying foxes, you know, bats calling overhead and crocodiles in the water. Uh, it's a fascinating place and at the far end there was tons of flying foxes. It was, it was beautiful uh, and, and strange. And we did this right around Halloween. It was the perfect perfect thing to do for <laughs> Halloween. Um, near there, we got out of the Kimberley back on the highway, uh, a herper acquaintance that I had met online that told me to, how to find a couple reptiles I wanted to see, uh, told us about this a limestone quarry uh, in, the, in the Kimberley region. And these beautiful uh, boab trees were all over the place. The, the setting was just uh, you know unbelievable uh, with the trees and the rocks and everything like that. We spent I can't remember if it was one or two nights here, uh, but we found one of the lizard I wanted to find, which I'll show you later. Uh, but that was a, I think we just did one night here, but that, that was a fascinating place. So we got back on the highway and then it was a pretty big jump for us. Uh, we spent one more night at Broome and then we spent a night somewhere in here, but our next goal was to get to Ningaloo Reef and Exmouth area and uh, the Coral Reef area. So that's where we drove next. And here is the Ningaloo Reef and you can go snorkeling right from the beach. You know, just beautiful coral, so many fish. Uh, it, was, it was really nice. Uh, not being an underwater photographer, I don't really have anything to show you there, but uh, it was neat. And then Hamish can't be here, but Hamish put this, on, this spot on the map for me, the stromatolites of Shark Bay. So just south of Exmouth uh, Peninsula and Cape Range National Park is uh, Shark Bay, where that monk place Monkey Maya is. And stromatolites are about the oldest known life form on Earth. And there's some symbiosis of bacteria and algae or something like that, and they're still alive, um, but they only occur today in a few places in the world, um, but there's some active patches of stromatolites. And Hamish has wanted to see these his whole life, and I knew nothing about them until he mentioned them to me, and then I saw we were going right by. Um, so we went to the stromatolites of Shark Bay. Now, Show, I'm focusing on you know the wonderful things of what we saw, but not everything was wonderful. Um, <laughs> Australia is famous for its flies, and no two ways about it, they were a nuisance most of where we went. They weren't normally this bad. At the stromatolites, they were horrendous, and we could barely be out of our car. This is a, a Dutch uh, tourist that we bumped into, and I don't know what it was about him uh, if he just wasn't, you know, trying to get you know, trying to fend him off or whatever, but his face and his wrists were just covered in flies. And yeah, I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, in this particular place, they were horrendous, but they were a nuisance uh, much of our travel. It was hot and we did a lot of driving. So that's probably the, the biggest negatives of, of our, our travels and the way we did this vacation. Uh, this is Shark Bay, it was neat. You could stare, stare from this cliff and see sharks and rays you know, crossing the shallow water. All that dark stuff is eelgrass. Uh, dugongs live out there. We didn't see any of those, but, but they're present. And then we went to this tourist trap called Monkey Maya, where they feed dolphins right at the beach. And it's a definite you know, tourist attraction where every morning uh, at a certain time, uh, people stand on the beach and these people that work there uh, will feed these dolphin uh, by hand. These are completely wild dolphin and then they'll, they'll uh, swim out into Shark Bay for the rest of the day. Um, but it was pretty cool. Any, any chance to see dolphin like that is pretty exciting. And so that's uh, these two places. The Exmouth is up here and 
Shark Bay and the Command Lights were right there, but then we jumped on down and got to the southwest, uh, the Perth area. And we hit two islands, Rottnest Island and um, Penguin Island. This is Perth right here, and Rottnest Island is just offshore. You take a little ferry, and we camped out there for a couple of nights. And then we got back on shore, drove down, and uh, camped close by here, and made a good little day trip to Penguin Island. And these are just like 20 miles apart as the crow flies. Um, little fascinating places. Here's Rottnest Island. This is really cool. Isn't that neat? pattern, um, it's not really coral, it, it's rock and algae that grows on the rock, but what makes all those patterns, we were told, is fish, uh, these territorial fish that graze the algae, and the in between the territories uh, gets to grow wild because uh, it, you know, it's not grazed because it's uh, right on the boundary, it's like the demilitarized zone between the Koreas or something. <laughs> Uh, so all those lines of algae are the, ter are the boundaries between the fish territories. I don't know what the fish looks like, but anyway, I thought that was fascinating and left a, a striking pattern. Uh, this is more of Rottnest Island. Uh, there's some cool wildlife there, uh, quokkas that I'll get into when we talk about mammals. Quokkas are actually a problem. They have to keep them out of the stores. Uh, so that's why there's gators here, no quokkas allowed. And then we went to Penguin Island, and it had penguins, uh, and they're nocturnal, so they're hard to see, but we were with some biologists that took us to some nesting boxes and got to see some chicks, and then we saw some captive ones uh, that couldn't be released. Uh, and then we go further into the southwest, so here we got to Busselton area, uh, saw some cool birds around here, and then we got to Denmark, Albany, and Chains Beach. Uh, those were kind of our last destinations before we went up here to Dryandra Forest uh, on the way back to Perth. So I hope you guys can keep that uh, straight, uh, but that's why I kind of included the map several different times. Um, Busselton is a neat town in Southwest and is famous for this jetty, and this jetty, a dock up here, goes almost 1.8 kilometers uh, into the gulf there. Uh, it's huge, in fact, there's a train that takes tourists out there. We chose to walk out. And at the end of it, or near the end of it, is a huge canister that goes all the way to the bottom. It's like 50 feet deep right there. And this isn't an aquarium, we're in the aquarium. Uh, so it has glass sides and you're looking out into the ocean and this is all bait fish that was swarming around and we saw bait jacks. And it would be, you know, we could see an octopus that somebody had spotted. Um, anyway, there's windows kind of all the way around, and it was fascinating, and you could spend a lot of time there. It was a, you know, a really neat destination. And in the southwest, you get out of the desert, and you get into big gum tree forests. And so it changes from the desert that we saw on most of our trip to these la this large gum forest, um, and much of, you know, some of which is in national parks and, and, and and preserves. Uh, this was fascinating. This was an early morning uh, at this park for this tree that you could climb. And uh, I don't know what the liability would be on this thing if they had it in the States. There's these rebar spikes stuck into the tree in a spiral, and there is a cable going around the outside of it. But you, they just told you that if it's, if it's rainy or windy, don't go up there. That was the only warning they gave you. And it's hot. Uh, so here uh, are two people that were coming down right before I went up. And uh, you're 100, 150 feet up. I forget exactly how high we were. There were several different platforms. Yeah? You've been there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was neat. Uh, you know, we, we were definitely way the heck up there. So yeah, it was fascinating. <laughs> they didn't tell us that. And then there was this sky bridge, another place uh, nearby. It was definitely trendier uh, for uh, walking around and getting as view as you can of these gum forests. And then Chains Beach is uh, a, a popular birding area. The whole coast is gorgeous with blue, blue water. It's cold water now. Uh, so we've gone from where there's crocodiles to where there's penguins. Uh, it's cold water, but beautiful, you know, rocky coast, you know, caves and things like that. Um, and then we made that jump back to Perth over land to Dryandra Forest, uh, which is pretty well known for a, a rare mammal called numbats, and we spent a little bit of time there looking for numbats. Um, and it's a, a 
so much of the southwest corner of Australia has been developed and planted for wheat, and so these timber patches are relatively rare, and the wildlife that occurs that seems to live in them is relatively rare. So that <coughs> rounded us back to Perth. Uh, we've come full circle. And I just told you that it's hard to cover the wildlife because it's so diverse, uh, from crocodiles to penguins, uh, and all everything in between, uh, or a lot of a lot of neat stuff in between. So we had a lot to cover. You know, that was what I was really into and wanting to photograph. Um, so we set out looking for it. And there's a lot of things that kind of whet your appetite when you drive around and see signs like that. You're thinking, wow, this is going to be pretty cool. And you got to look out for emus, echidnas, kangaroos, and lizards. Um, you got to be dingo aware. And we saw some of these. Uh, on the peninsula near Shark Bay, where our dingo, or I'm sorry, bilby warning signs, you know, caution bil uh, bilby crossing. Uh, there's an electric fence that uh, uh, keeps predators out of that, off that peninsula, and they have wild bilbies to get there. And of course, this always whets my appetite when I see signs like this. This summarizes the status of wildlife, uh, especially small marsupials in Australia. Uh, this is a poster hanging in the Broome Observatory, and basically, Australia is an ecological wreck because of cats and foxes and uh, cane toads that have, have made the news uh, recently. But exotics have trashed uh, Australia's native wildlife, even in really, really remote areas. Feral cats are, you know, uh, enemy number one. Uh, they eat so many of the native. Uh, uh, small mammal, small native marsupials, and have really, so it's hard to see uh, nat uh, Australia's native mammals. Um, and as a result, there's management areas that go to great lengths to exclude those predators, foxes and cats in particular, and they do that either with fencing, uh, electric fencing, and it, it, you can only fence out so much, uh, but they have numerous preserves uh, Bush Heritage, Australia is one of them that, that manages the Charles Darwin Reserve where he stays, and there's other agencies or, or nonprofits that, that uh, do things like that. Uh, or they'll just poison at large, like you can't let your dog run loose, or they'll get into Canadian poison uh, set out to kill you know, these foxes and cats that, that live there. Um, this is uh, by, the sh by Shark Bay. It's a very narrow uh, isthmus uh, that leads to a large peninsula. And they have a so they get a lot of a lot of bang for their buck for you know about a quarter mile of electric fence, uh, complete with barking dog uh, recordings at the cattle gate uh, where you drive onto it. Um, but uh, yeah, they're going to great lengths to provide some places that are relatively predator free uh, to have to reintroduce these these native mammals. Larger marsupials you know, do okay, but. On the first part of our trip, like to Char Charles Darwin Reserve and Karajini National Park, it's desert and there's not a lot of large uh, mammals. Um, so we didn't see very much. This isn't until we got to the coast to that Cape Corazon uh, that we started seeing. This is a wallaroo or a, a common wallaroo. Um, there's another name to go by. Uh, anyway, blanking on that right now. But so we started seeing some large mammals when we got to the coast. Uh, this is an agile wallaby, and we ended up seeing quite a few of those in a few areas up to the north from uh, Cape Corazon and over to the Kimberley. This is uh, one that came up close at the Broom Observatory where I would see little herds of them across the road when we were driving. Uh, in the campground at Lujana Gorge, they were commonplace, and here's a mother with a joey in her pouch, and here's a female in the front with a much larger male in the background. Uh, this is a really cute uh, rock wallaby, a short-eared rock wallaby. This is at Winjana Gorge. These were kind of hard to see. We only uh, caught glimpses of a couple of these when we walked into the gorge. And then the bats, and these were fascinating. And we've now seen them in different parts of Australia. And uh, flying foxes are large bats. Uh, they have wingspans, you know, three feet or even uh, more than that. Uh, this is what they call a little red flying fox. Its wingspan is right around three feet. And uh, at Winjana Gorge and that Tunnel Cave, there were huge colonies of these. Uh, here they all, they roost in the daytime on tree branches or at Tunnel Creek inside that cave. 
uh, you know, just very, very dense. And one of our favorite things at several different places that we've visited now is to watch them fly out at dusk. And here's a still photograph at Louisiana Gorge uh, where they're flying overhead. Uh, that pool is where all the crocs are. In fact, they'll try to drink water as they first come off the roost. And uh, crocs will try to catch them in flight as they splash down. Uh, here's a little video clip. At sunset, we sat on this beach by that, that pool. Just thousands of these. And you can hear all the screeching. And this is in Tunnel K, Tunnel Creek uh, National Park. This is Paula walking with a headlamp, and you'll have to listen. Now, mind you, there's crocodiles in these little puddles that are hard to see because it's kind of dark in there. This is our Halloween. Walk and you have to wade little sections of it. Uh, it's really neat. So now we're made our jump, and so I'm, I'm taking you on the mammals that we've seen, uh, kind of doing our lap, and then I'm going to do that same lap with the birds and then with the reptiles. So now we're back to Ningaloo Reef, uh, you know, where the beautiful coral reef is in Cape Rains National Park. Um, a woman that worked at the campground, Genevieve, uh, she told us to hike to the Dangu Dangu Gorge and is where we could see these black flank rock wallabies. And sure enough, when we walked in these gorge, you start looking at the cliffs and these things are staring at you from little ledges. They were gorgeous and they were quite abundant actually right there. Uh, so we did that hike a couple of times, uh, looking at the uh, uh, rock wallabies. Uh, but then these wallaroos uh, were relatively, uh, Euro is the other name that they go by. Uh, common wallaroo, wallaroo or Euro. And it's a relatively large uh, you know, kangaroo that has kind of long hair. Uh, we've seen those on, in Central Australia on previous trips. And we even saw a few of the largest uh, marsupial, and that's the red kangaroo around the town of X South and on the uh, Cape Range National Park we saw a few of these. Here's a dingo. Uh, we saw just a few of those in Cape Range National Park. Uh, they were walking the roads quite often. This one was stopped for a scratch right in the middle of the road. <laughs> Some of them didn't look very good. I think some of them have mange and some other uh, uh, problems. Uh, but these, these guys look relatively healthy. And then we went to Monkey Maya, uh, where we saw the dolphin. And you can see this dolphin sneaking up, uh, trying to get something out of the bucket. And I think, the, hopefully the woman knows it's there. Here's some of the tourists watching a little pod of dolphin come by. And I've already showed you the picture, the close-up of the dolphin. And here's uh, some woman right in front of us. Yeah, it was gorgeous. We just don't get to see them like this very often. We did snorkeling get to see some dolphin uh, come relatively close by us uh, on the Ningaloo Reef as well. And now we've jumped to Rottnest Island, uh, which is right off Perth, and we spent a couple of nights camping there, and we rented bikes, and we were riding bikes around there. But Rottnest is famous for what people are calling you know, one of the cutest mammals on Earth, the quokka. They're everywhere. They're even running around town. They tell you not to feed them, but people are feeding them. Um, but just in the campground or just anywhere in the bush, you see these quokkas. They're very easy to see. Anyway, they're yeah, adorable and uh, just hanging out grazing. Uh, they're diurnal, not just out at night like so many of the mammals are. And one of my pictures even got published on the cover of Ranger Rick Jr. Uh, uh, about a year ago. So that was pretty exciting for me. And then we go further into the southwest, kangaroos. This is western gray kangaroo. We're quite abundant. And uh, we uh, spent a couple evenings just watching these herd. Uh, the kangaroos in this area have, I think just genetically, uh, have this frequently have white markings on their head. And it, made, it was very striking. This one in particular was beautiful. They don't all have it, but that characteristic is rel relatively common in the southwest. So this is a western gray kangaroo. Uh, with really pretty markings. Oops. Here's that same original. Here's the Western Gray with a joey in the pouch. And this close up of the joey with its big back legs. That's why they call them macropods, is because of the large hind feet.
feet of uh, kangaroos, the kangaroos and wallabies. And uh, down at Chain Beach, uh, quendas. And that's, this is like typical of the small mammals that are so rare in Australia because of foxes and cats. Um, but they've done a lot of poisoning around there and they've con done controlled burns to keep the, the habitat uh, good. And so quendas or brown bandicoots were relatively common and we saw several of them at Chains Beach, one of our, one of our last stops on the south coast. Um, we did see uh, a numbat, but I got no pictures. It was a glimpse. It, it, it kind of jumped in the road a little bit ahead of us and just took off. Uh, people can uh, see them relatively well. But at Dryandra, uh, that forested area in southwest, the very last stop of our trip, um, we did get to see one numbat, but this is a picture of a mural on the wall to show you what they look like. But they did have this fascinating little place called Barnamaya, and these are captive animals, but it's their attempt to show people some of these rare nocturnal uh, small marsupials that have become extinct in much of the country. And they have a fenced in area. Um, here's a picture, a painting on the wall of what some of them look like. What has to be one of the cutest animals in the world is this one, the bilby. Uh, I'll tell, challenge you to Google it when you go home and look at more pictures of bilbies because they are just precious, but extremely rare. Uh, but in this setting, when you go into this fenced area at night, uh, they have a natural habitat where the animals roam around, but you all sit in a bench, uh, on benches, and they'll throw out some food, and with infrared lights on your uh, headlamps, you'll see some of these animals come out of the, the habitat, and here is a wild, well, not a wild, but a, here is a live bilby that we got to see at pretty close range. That was uh, precious. And now the birds. So we're gonna take another lap. We're back to uh, Charles Darwin Reserve. Um, this is a splendid fairy wren. Um, fairy wrens occur across Australia. They're mostly vibrant, vibrantly colored. The naming gets uh, there's splendid fairy wren, there's precious fairy wren, red-backed fairy wren, uh, uh, beautiful fairy wren is another one. Uh, they kind of use up their adjectives describing these birds. Um, then we, I'm jumping to Karajini uh, National uh, National Park. Uh, this was one of my targets. I want we'd seen them in Central Australia, but they're a spectacular pigeon, spinifex pigeon. And again, you know, on my slide, on, on my screen, I'm seeing the, the this deep red earth that they live in, uh, in, the, in the desert habitat, but a striking, striking pigeon. Here's a close-up of the head of one. Uh, in that rock gorge that we hiked, this is a cuckoo, a pheasant cuckoo uh, that we saw. So they lay their eggs in other, other birds' nests. Uh, and now I'm jumping to Broome, which is famous for its shorebirds. Um, and the Bird Observatory you know, does a lot of shorebird research there. This is a, a gray tattler. Um, here's a flock of shorebirds. I think these are sharp-tailed uh, sandpipers, uh, which were a common one there. This is a, a jabiru, a black-necked stork. But even though uh, I consider myself somewhat a birder, both of us are, and we were in a famous birding place, the birds were kind of second fiddle to what I really wanted to see there, and that was a fish. Uh, on the mud flats uh, in this area, this fish called a mud skipper uh, lives, and I was fascinated by those, and they were a huge target that I wanted to photograph. This is called a blue spotted mud skipper, so pretty soon I started ignoring the shorebirds, I wade out into the muck, um, and it took a lot to get photos of these. They're, they're actually quite wary, and sitting in the mud, you get bit by stuff. So this is my leg after a few hours sitting in the mud one morning. Uh, it itched for a while, but it uh, wasn't, wasn't that bad. It did go away. Um, here I am not wearing socks. That's muck. And I've been sitting in the mud for several hours after sunrise uh, photographing the mud skippers. But they were fascinating to watch. So you get out onto the mud flats, and everything would spook and go into the mud. They burrow into the mud and you'd have to sit for 10 or 15 minutes, and Paula did this with me once. And after 10 or 15 minutes, the first eyeballs start poking up out of the, their little tunnels in the mud. And then they'll get a little more comfortable with time uh, and come out on, and they crawl around on top of the mud and they're pretty showy. They do a lot of displaying with their fins and flipping and jumping in the air and even fighting. So here's a close up of one. 
What a crazy looking fish. Here's one displaying, kind of flipping its tail up in the air. They're already like a couple of inches long, right? Uh, they're actually kind of big, five, five or six inches long. Uh, they're, they're halfway sizable, actually. And uh, yeah, here's two pair. So they, you know, they all have little territories, but one will get a little too close, so one will run over, and then they'll have a little battle. And it was hilarious. <laughs> I don't know how a fish looks ferocious, but this is exactly that. Uh, and these all happen pretty quickly. And what's neat is I, you know, I've posted and shared these images on my Instagram and Facebook, and I've kept in touch with some of the photographers and people that I met in my travels. Some people have contacted me to find out how to photograph these things. Oprah Levy and Lewis Burnett, two photographers I met, uh, were picking my brain um, to how to get to you know, find these things. So it's kind of flattering that Alaska is helping Australian photographers uh, find these fish. And this is a striated heron uh, stalking the mud flats. And this is a different species of mud skipper, but they gotta be wary. They're wary for a reason, because there's things that are out to get them. Now we're jumping to the birds at Winjana Gorge in the Kimberley region. This is a magpie lark. They're a real common, kind of all over Australia, but they're a striking bird. Um, this is one of our favorites too, is bower birds. And there's several different species of, of, across Australia. Here's a agile wallaby photobombing me while I'm photographing a, a greater bower bird. But these are the ones that build spectacular, uh, they're not nests, they're mating structures uh, just for display to attract a female. And they'll collect shells or, or they'll co collect objects. In this case, it's white shells. And then with uh, the smikes on our 2014 trip in Eastern Australia, in Queensland, it was satin bower birds that collected blue things. And, and they're sometimes plastic or blue rocks or whatever. Um, but the greater bower bird likes to collect white things. They stack them in front of their uh, bower to attract females. Here's a male um, maintaining his bower and all his white collections there. This is right in the campground in Winjana Gorge, just a few yards from our tent. So I would just you know, get up in the morning, sit down with my camera and tripod and just watch these things. It was fascinating. We've seen the bowers before in other parts of our travels, but never got to watch this behavior. And here's one arranging, you know, want their things arranged just perfectly. Yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, we went a little further south and then we turned around. We wanted to go uh, to a, another park, but it was so hot, like I say, a hundred, well into the hundreds at this point. And we had to cut our Kimberley time short and plus we had a lot of ground to cover. But this is a, 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 a blue kookaburra, uh, you know, a, a, kind of the converse to the la laughing kookaburra that occurs in much of Australia. These guys are real striking in color. Here's a brolga. Um, this is working our way back down the coast. Uh, Royal Spoonbill. Uh, we saw a little camping spot. And now we're at Nunguru Reef, Cape Range National Park. Some of the birds there, galahs. These are actually all over the country, these pink parrots. Parrots make up a lot of the bird life in Australia. Uh, they have really diverse. In fact, on the table here, I have two bird books, a reptile book and a mammal book, if you guys want to thumb through those. Um, uh, Australian Buster, a fascinating bird that just puts on this crazy uh, mating uh, plumage and you know transforms into a whole different looking animal during the mating season. A banded lapwing, some of the birds I saw. Uh, this is the town of Exmouth with its uh, emu crossing sign. And here's an emu walking right through the campground. <laughs> they were walking by my camper in my fire tent. You know, a five foot tall bird just walking around. <laughs> Close up of one, this is at uh, Monkey Maya, where the dolphins are. Uh, this is some of the bird life at Monkey Maya, Australian pelicans, which we saw in a number of locations. Pretty cool to see a shorebird that comes to Alaska to breed. This is a bar -tailed uh, two bar-tailed godwits. Uh, many of them winter in Australia, or they all winter in Australia or New Zealand. They're the ones that set the long distance flight record. Uh, that was just beat recently by a bird that went from Southwest Alaska to Tasmania nonstop. Uh, so anyway, these guys are, are phenomenal and do get them in the spring. Um, this was on Rotten Nest Island, uh, one of the oyster catchers. And then 
and here's the, the only wild penguin that we saw on this trip. We saw them with the smikes on our uh, Tasmania uh, trip uh, in 2014, but the only wild ones that we saw were the chicks that were taken from a nest box. So they were weighing them and doing some uh, monitoring of the, the wild chicks. Uh, so it was handheld while we looked at it. But this is a, a little penguin, it's a species, a little penguin chick. A buff banded rail, these guys were walking around. Uh, uh, this is on yeah, Penguin Island again. And crested terns, there was a nice colony of crested terns. You can see a chick at the bottom and they were uh, flying in with fish to feed the chicks. And then we jumped down by Bustleton in the southwest uh, and we met a charming man that I had met on a, uh, a bird photography, the Australian bird photography forum. He helped us find these birds. You know, I contacted him and asked him you know, if, for some tips for finding emu wrens. He says, hey, just meet me. And so we met and he drove us to this place and sure enough, we found southern emu wrens, which were just spectacular. They were high on my want list of uh, those tail feathers. They were just something else. And very secretive. They didn't fit brush. Uh, but southern emu wrens were a real treat. And we saw them in a, a few more lo locations after this. There's a splendid fairy wren. This is in Denmark now, and their they're southern, southern coast. Laughing kookaburra. Australian wing, ringneck. These guys are really hard to photograph. <laughs> this is a waste of a telephoto lens here. And this is a Western Rosella. We saw other Rosellas in Eastern Australia. And a red capped parrot. Just so many spectacular birds that are so different than what we have here. This bird has a beautiful name, Noisy Scrub Wren, but it's probably the rarest bird in Australia, one of the rarest birds in Australia and Chains Beach is a good place to see them. And they have a loud, bubbly song, but they live in thick stuff and they don't leave it. But there was a gap, a little trail, uh, that birders would sit at at dusk and you could hear this thing calling and coming closer and then <clears throat> he'd run across the trail. And that was one. <laughs> he did stop briefly. This is heavily cropped, it's very far away. But this is a noisy scrub wren, a very rare bird. This is a Jackie Winter, is the name of this bird, on a nest on a stick in Dryandra Woodland. And then the last couple mornings in Perth, um, I wanted still to photograph this duck called a, a, a pink eared duck. And I heard that some of the ponds uh, in the city park were a good place to see them. And uh, it turned out to be a really good place uh, for a great crested grebe. And I found on the final morning of the trip uh, some very uh, cooperative pink eared ducks. Uh, kind of like our shoveler, uh, but it's even a more bizarre bill, and they have that little pink spot. Uh, here's one swimming. They really just treat in a nice way to end the trip. So, now reptiles. I'm gonna go through one more lap uh, with the reptiles that we saw. Um, everybody hears everything scary about Australia is, you know, all these dangerous things that are out to kill you. Well, there are some dangerous <laughs> things there, but snakes for one. You've heard about all the dangerous snakes. We're looking, we're walking at night with headlamps, we're driving slow on roads at night looking for lizards and snakes to be out. We saw about three snakes in six weeks of travel looking for this stuff. Uh, maybe I'm a bad herpetologist, but uh, we just did not see much. The extreme heat didn't help. When it's that hot and dry up in the north, that probably affected our ability to find some things. Um, but anyway, we were looking. We did see just a few snakes. We found two pythons, uh, Stimson, they were both the same kind, Stimson's python, and they're relatively small, you know, might have been about this big or so. And in Eastern Australia, we saw some really cool ones. In fact, we've now seen about eight different species of, of pythons in Australia. But anyway, Stimson's was a new one, it was beautiful. Uh, that, this is the other one we found by Coral Bay. <coughs> this is one of the snakes that Australia is known for uh, being very poisonous. It's uh, uh, King Brown or Mulga. And at first we thought this was pretty cool. It was on the road, there were some people standing nearby. It was uh, a little bit aggressive when you got near it. Turns out it had been run over and was getting ready to die. Oh. It became less and less active as we were around it. And uh, pretty soon you can even see some red in its mouth. Uh, anyway, it didn't make it. It was dead the next day. But it was large and these are described in the reptile book that I have there as dangerously venomous. They're, they're bad news. Uh, the or the uh, family of poisonous snakes that live in Australia are related to 
covert and are very poisonous. You know, you, they're nothing to mess with. And I kind of know snakes a little bit, but I, at, even if I'd seen more, would have kind of kept these things at arm's length. So that would be, be a couple. Um, at Rock Nest Island is where we saw the most snakes. We saw about three or four dew guides, and they're also dangerously venomous. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the dangerous ones to look out for there. Um, yeah, it, we just got kind of quick looks at them. They were pretty secretive in the brush. Um, but anyway, they're one of the poisonous snakes, but they just wanted to get away from them. Uh, it was kind of cool. That was our best look at snakes other than the python. And then one exception in Southwest, we saw this snake. It's a yellow-faced whip snake. Um, they're in the same family of poisonous snakes, but these guys apparently aren't so bad. I still didn't grab it. And it was actually very beautiful, you know, the, the pattern and the scales on it. All of them did look at this one too. Um, and uh, a lot of cool, so that was it for snakes. Uh, I'd like to have seen more, but we didn't see much. Um, lizards, uh, we saw quite a few of and spent some time looking for them. And I'll get into the geckos in some detail. This is one uh, shingleback that we saw on a couple a couple places and we had seen on a, our previous trip through Central Australia. Uh, but they're a very large skink uh, and sometimes they're in pairs. You'll, you'll see a, a, a pair of them uh, side by side. Um, at Charles Darwin Reserve, this is a, a dwarf bearded dragon that we saw on the road. Here's the first of our geckos, a western beak gecko, cute little guy. Uh, at a camp spot, you know, just kind of middle of nowhere, the marbles, uh, we found this uh, western marble velvet gecko. We'd seen another uh, gecko up by Darwin on, on a previous trip. Um, in Karajini National Park, uh, like I said, there wasn't many mammals, but there were some reptiles out and about. Uh, this is a black-headed monitor. So these are the same family of lizards as Komodo dragons, uh, but this is a relatively small one, just about a, a foot or two. And then yellow spotted monitor, we saw a couple of those in the canyon along the trail. And this one, I got, I did get a picture of it. It caught this huge centipede, and it was digging, 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 and it caught the centipede, but then it turned away from me to eat it. Um, so there's this really colorful centipede that it's eating, but I didn't get any better clips of those than that. Uh, a dragon, a green-tailed jack dragon. This is just a phone picture. It was really tame, uh, sitting on a rock in Karajini National Park. And I went out of my way looking for geckos at night, you know, going on night walks or slow drives uh, at night, on, you know, looking for them on the road. And there was a, a family of, of geckos called bitey tailed geckos, and this is how they get their name uh, from these little spines on their tails. They're, they're not very big, they're only about this big. Um, but what I was fascinated by them is their eyes. And uh, we'd seen one other species on a previous trip, um, but there were several that we could encounter on this. This is a Western Shield spiny-tailed gecko, and a close-up showing the most one of the most fascinating eyes in the animal kingdom. It's got to be, but there were more. I'll show you some more. Uh, when we got to Broome, uh, we found one at night, uh, and this is a northern spiny-tailed gecko, and there's a close-up of its eye. Uh, so now we've left Broome. That's the reptiles we saw there. Now we're back to Windjana Gorge uh, up in the Kimberley. And that pool that had crocodiles in it uh, just stacked up. So here, there's three crocodiles in this picture right here. These are freshwater crocodiles. They're not the ones that kill people. They don't get as big. Maybe four or five feet might be about as big as they get. And they have a much narrower uh, rostrum, you know, a nose. Um, but anyway, they, they were abundant in this pool that was, you know, isolated because of the drought. Uh, here's a few sunning on the beach. These guys were covered with bat shit. They were underneath the uh, flying fox uh, roofs, probably waiting for dead fox, you know, or wounded or fox, you know, flying foxes to fall out of the trees. And then here's a bunch just basking along the shore when I don't know how many are in here. Uh, anyway, we chose not to swim in this pool anyway. <laughs> and in that cave, uh, Tunnel Creek, uh, walking in the dark, we almost stumbled into this. This is a long exposure that you know, makes it look relatively bright, but it was quite dark in there. And anyway, there was a crocodile. His root, he was kind of just hanging out, um, basking with his mouth open. Uh, and here's a close-up of his teeth. And then after that big flood, they suddenly had tons of water. And this is a crocodile, freshwater crocodile, in all the junk and debris uh, the following day after that big uh, rainstorm that flooded the river. Um, at that limestone quarry I told you about, where all the boab trees were, uh, this is a recently described species of velvet gecko. This is a, a lime, 
Cisco, Delta Gecko, that was just described just a few years ago, a relatively new species, newly discovered species. Um, a herpetologist had told me where to find these. Uh, that range probably brought out some things like this, like this green frog, we saw a couple of these. But this is one that I really wanted to see, this northern knob-tailed gecko. This is what their little tails are like. Uh, we only found this one, and now I wish I had photographed it even more. I thought we'd find, we found it pretty quick, but we just couldn't find any after that. Uh, but just a stunning, and this is relatively large, maybe five or six inches uh, long. Um, just a stunning, bizarre uh, looking lizard. So that was a real treat. The turtle go girls that we met at Ke the swimming hole in Caratini, they were turtle biologists that did surveys uh, by Port Hedland on the north coast. And they told us to look them up when we came back through there, and we did. I don't have any pictures from night, uh, but we went out with them and saw uh, nesting, you know, uh, flatback sea turtles uh, digging nests and laying their eggs, and making tracks the next morning of one going back to sea. Flatback sea turtles is a species. Back to Cape Range National Park, uh, uh, a really neat lizard. This is a monitor, uh, the Perendi. It's related. It's the biggest lizard in Australia. It can be five or six feet long, and this is. Uh, second or third biggest lizard in the rule in the world after Komodo dragon, and they're stunningly colored with this, these markings uh, well, on their back and their throat. This must be where a lot of the aboriginal design comes from. Is uh, you know, patterns of, of wildlife like this. Uh, we found a couple more uh, spiny-tailed geckos. This is the western spiny-tailed gecko. Uh, fascinating eyes on this. And then an Exmouth uh, spiny-tailed gecko, another species we just stumbled into, one individual uh, near Coral Bay. Uh, swimming, we saw another reptile. This is a green sea turtle. This picture is taken by Lewis Burnett, uh, who I've stayed in touch with. Uh, but that's me with a little point and shoot. I don't do underwater photography, but Paula has a little camera that works underwater. So there's the kind of group of tourists that went out. We went out to see manta rays, and we did. We swam with manta rays that day. Uh, but with the sea turtle, I dove down to get some pictures, and there's the rest of the group up on the surface. And Lewis was the photographer with the boat that took pictures of the tourists and sold them to us, uh, you know, after, after we got back. Uh, Rottnest Island, some really cool reptiles. I told you about the dugite, the snake uh, that we saw there. But king skinks were common, and these are a large skink. Uh, I don't know if you've seen an alligator lizard. In North America, we call that a big skink. These things are like three times that size, big fat lizards uh, that were pretty common at uh, uh, Rottnest Island. Here's a close-up of one. <clears throat> and on Rottnest Island at night, I found my fifth spiny-tailed gecko species, and the one I wanted to see the most. Uh, it's called a soft spiny-tailed uh, lizard, uh, spiny-tailed uh, gecko. And look at the eye on that one, just brilliant yellow. And this was kind of my trifecta. We only saw. I think eight different spiny-tailed gecko individuals, but they represented five species. And I put together this little graphic that has all, all five of the species that we saw uh, in Western Australia. And I think it's all the ones that occur in Western Australia. Anyway, just fascinating uh, lizards. And this about rounds out the lizard, the heat monitor uh, from uh, the coast near Chains Beach. Uh, we saw this one, another shingleback near Dryandra Forest. And then another goanna, sand goanna, or sand monitor uh, in Dryandra Forest. So that's the wildlife. And now I just want to finish off with some of the people that we met that just made this trip wonderful. You know, Australia has so many friendly people, and then travel is easy. Uh, you know, the language you can kind of understand, uh, but uh, <laughs> basically isn't a barrier there. And uh, the people are just welcoming. It's safe. Uh, we haven't had any problems. You know, with theft uh, with you know just reasonable precaution. Um, a friend in Anchorage who I was talking to about this trip said, oh, you gotta meet Andrew and Marilyn Burbage. And I'm gonna forget some names. I wrote them down just in case I forget. Let me pull out this piece of paper. Uh, so not knowing us at all, they go, oh, we'll pick you up at the airport and you can stay you know, before you. And so we stayed with them when we got there, when we passed through Perth uh, as on our way to the Southwest, and then the final night they drove us to the airport. Just, and he's a, a retired biologist that has studied all these rare uh, islands or, or all these rare animals that have been reintroduced to preserves like islands you know, where predators haven't made it yet. So he's done wonderful work. And uh, anyway, they were just treated us like gold. So 
from Maryland, and uh, uh, Andrew Burbage uh, was their name. Um, the Charles Darwin Preserve. We pulled into there, and they were closed, uh, closed for the season because summer was there, you know, in the hot. And we drove up. We found the house of the manager. Two little naked kids, you know, two <laughs> boys were running around, and uh, we found him, and he was all ready to. He told us later, all ready to send us out of there. You know, you know we're sorry, we're closed. I told him, I'm from Alaska. I'm a biologist. You know, we just want a place to stay. He goes, okay. He showed us the campground. The following night, he and his wife and his kids brought us some beers and visited with us over a campfire. Uh, and he just told us all about the Bush Heritage of Australia and the conservation work that they do at this Charles Darwin, Darwin Reserve and other places. Um, they, their names were uh, the Hanson family, William Hanson, his wife, William Hanson, his wife was Olivia, and their kids were Hamish and Louie. That's, that's there was another Hamish. And, and when we Louis showed family. up, he was in his a bath towel, wasn't he? Yeah. Like get, take, get ready to take a bath. He was in a yeah. bath towel. But oh, he just, it just turned around and they were so nice to us. Uh, yeah, we just felt like loyalty there. Um, and with Jana Gorge, uh, we met a biker that was biking across Australia, the desert, uh, in 100 degree heat, self-contained. And uh, Aaron Hall was his name. And I haven't seen him post on Facebook for a while, but I followed him for a little bit. Um, anyway, we helped him out. We drove him to Tunnel Creek, uh, that cave. He went with us that day. Uh, it was a, a little extra trip for him. It would have been a little uh, extra trip on his bike. Uh, it was handy for him to ride with us and visit that park uh, that day and then come back to Regina Gorge. But he was heading the same direction we were, and he had a large section where there wasn't going to be any water. Right? I was hoping to bump into when we knew we'd see him again because we were going to drive a stretch that we knew he was on, and it occurred to me that we could be able to help him out. So we saw him and we told him, hey, can we help you? Uh, where would you like some water? And so he described an area. Uh, we, uh, you know, when we were leaving on the way to Exmouth, you know, leaving the whole area, we ditched several bottles of water and uh, texted him and told him where they were, gave him coordinates. And sure enough, he found them and he sent us this picture of him uh, with the water that we left for him. Uh, super nice and hardcore guy with the biking that he, that he, he was doing. Um, this is a family we, we met at the Bird Observatory. Both we stayed there twice, you know, before the Kimberly and after the Kimberly. The Furness family. Uh, the two older girls were completely into birding. You know, young girls, and we thought that they were just into it because the family was into it. But they were into it on their own, and the family, the parents, were just supporting their girls' interests. And so they were on a year trip around Australia, uh, mostly birding uh, for these two girls. And that little uh, smaller girl was precious, uh, you know, very friendly family that we're still in touch with, and hopefully we'll see again someday. Uh, this is Lewis Burnett, the photographer that took the picture of me, taking the picture of the turtles. This is on the other side of that, that he's taking that picture. Uh, a very good photographer that's doing some neat work. He's in Africa right now. now this is a, a couple from Chile. Uh, this is Loreto and Javier from Chile, and we kind of were paralleling them. We were leapfrogging, camping at the same places for several nights in a row, and they were noticeable because they they had a sticker on their truck that said, Chile is not at war. Is that what it says? Yeah. Yeah, Chile is not at war. And so we had a nice conversation about politics of the country, Chile, and uh, what's going on there because of uh, kind of some ugly stuff that was happening with the government. Um, this is the guy that showed us the Southern Emu Wren. And I'm not sure that he's still alive. He was suffering from something and was kind of losing more and more ability to do things. Ray Walker was his name. He was freezing his ass off because uh, there was a little wind uh, that day. Uh, but he was just a trooper and met us and you know had us follow him uh, to where the Southern Emu Rims were. And he's way into fishing. Uh, he he loves to fish all over the country or you know for most of his of his, of his life he's done that. Then on that last morning, photographing right in the city of Perth, I met the Chinese photographer who was going to school in Perth, uh, Ken Kwan. I'm still in touch with him. Uh, he showed me the Great Crested Grebe. We were both photographing that. And then this guy, I had seen on some online forums and we'd interacted before. Ofer Levy is his name. Um, and uh, I saw another photographer uh, and I was looking for that pink eared duck and her name is Athena. And uh, they were together, and uh, I said, you don't wouldn't have to know where any pink ear ducks were. And she goes, I'll show you a pink ear duck on a platter. 
And so she took me down this trail, and that's where I found my pink eared duck. But anyway, he and I had interacted on, a, on some bird photography forums in the past, and uh, he was the nicest guy. He does beautiful photography. He's Israeli, but uh, lives in Australia. And uh, yeah, we communicate. He's one of the ones that picked me, picked my brain for photographing the, the muskrat. So that's the trip in a nutshell. I hope I didn't bore anybody or make this too long. There's Paula and I enjoying a quokka on Rockland Island, and that's what I got. Uh,